You know, there are so many ways to create awesome guitar solos and killer licks that the vast choice of tools and techniques is sometimes more a burden than a blessing. Some even say that limitations are the creator's best friend. Now, most of us do learn a lot of ways to improvise, be it by learning theoretical aspects in order to create refreshing new sounds and tensions, or be it with dazzling speed and alien dexterity. But it seems inherent to guitar playing to often fall back to the things we can play with ease and confidence. Now, it's until we get saturated of playing solos that sound the same over and over again that we seek for new sounds and new musical ideas. Now, this tutorial is about an aid to find those new sounds and much more than that to understand musical structure better. It's all about the relationship between notes, which we call intervals. Now, this helps you to train your ears, learn the neck of the guitar better, and other benefits that, with no doubt, will make you a better musician. Now, first, we have to understand what intervals are and in which form they appear in chords and scales. Now, the definition of an interval is very straightforward. An interval is the difference in pitch between two notes, either melodic, also called horizontal, or harmonic, also called vertical. Melodic intervals occur when two notes are played successively and harmonic intervals occur when two notes are played at the same time, as happens in chords, for instance. In Western music, intervals are derived from the diatonic scale, like the C major scale, for instance. In our diatonic system, we have 12 different notes from one octave to the other. And with that, we have 12 semitone intervals. Now, these intervals can be defined by so-called cents, which is a unit that comes from a frequency ratio. Every one of the semitones in a 12-tone chromatic scale is 100 cents. Most guitar tuners indicate the amount of cents to high or to low when tuning strings. Now, the smallest interval in a diatonic system is the semitone, or half-step, which is 100 cents. But there are smaller intervals, for instance, in ethnic scales. Now, these smaller intervals are called microtones. There's even a guitar with an adjustable fretboard where you can insert your own frets to create such a microtonal fretboard. This is really mind-blowing. I'll put a link in the description. Now, in the next chapter, we look closer at the different intervals. Now, in the C major scale, we find seven notes. C, D, E, F, G, A, and B. We can extract seven intervals if we compare all the notes of this scale one by one with the tonic C. Now the first interval is the interval between the tonic C and the second note D. And we call this interval a second. Now the next interval occurs between the tonic C and the third note E. And we call this interval a third. The next interval occurs between the tonic C and the fourth note F. And we call this interval a fourth. As you can see, the notes become further apart from each other, uh, and the interval gets wider and wider. Now, the next interval is between the tonic C um, and the fifth note from the scale G. We call this interval a fifth, and we all know this as a power chord. The next interval occurs between the tonic C and the sixth note A, and we call this interval a sixth. The next interval is that between the tonic C and the seventh, which we call a seventh. The last interval is between the note C and the next note C. And this we call an octave, the distance between eight notes. Now, there's also an interval between two notes that are exactly the same. For instance, between the note C and exactly the same note C. And this is called a unison interval or a perfect prime. Now, although the major skill is a seven note skill, we know that the octave consists of 12 half steps. So there are more than seven intervals. And that becomes clear when we look at the interval between the tonic C and the second note D. This interval we named the second. But there's also a second interval between the note C and the note D flat. It's still a second interval, but the distance between these notes C and D flat is uh, a half step and not a whole step as between the notes C and D. Now this half-step interval we call a minor second. The interval between C and D that we started with is a whole step 
and therefore we call it a major second. Now, we can do this for every interval. The third is initially the distance between the notes C and E. The tonal distance is two whole steps. But there's also a third interval between the notes C and E flat, with one and a half step interval and sounds minor. Now, both are thirds, but we call C E flat a minor third, and we call C E a major third. The sound of the first one is with no doubt minor, and the other one has a clearly a major sound. The fourth can be C F, but also C F sharp. We call the distance between C and F a perfect fourth, because it's a perfect consonant sound. The interval between the notes C and F sharp is called an augmented fourth. And this augmented fourth is also known as a tritone. It's one of the most dissonant intervals and is often used for creating tension and release. Now the fifth has even more variations. It can be a distance between C and G, which is seven half steps, and we call this a perfect fifth, because it's a pleasant consonant sound. But there's also a fifth between the C and G flat. This distance between the notes is not seven, but six half steps. And we call this a diminished fifth. And there is a fifth between the notes C and G sharp with eight half steps, which we call an augmented fifth or sharp fifth. Now the sixth was the interval between the notes C and A, the first and sixth note from the major scale. The distance is nine half steps, but there's also a sixth between the notes C and A flat, which has only eight half steps. This sounds minor, and we call this a minor sixth. Now the original sixth between the C and A sounds major, and we call this a major sixth. The seventh, that's the interval between the notes C and B and has 11 half steps. It sounds pretty major and we call this a major seventh. But there's also a seventh between the C and B flat, which has only 10 half steps. Now this interval we call a minor seventh. The octave has no variations because it can only be uh, from C to C and 12 half steps wide. Now, how to put all this knowledge and, uh, to practice we see later on in the video. First, we're going to see how to study and recognize interval shapes on the neck of the guitar. Now, the easiest interval to learn on the neck of the guitar is the octave. Starting on the sixth string with the note C, you find the octave, which is the next note C, two frets up and two strings up. Do exactly the same when you start with a note on the fifth string. Two frets up, two strings up. But choosing a note on the fourth string is different. Now you go up three frets and two strings. With this trick, it's also very easy to find names of the notes of the guitar. If you only know the names of the lower two strings, you can trace a high positioned note back to the same note in the lower octave. The next very common interval is the fifth that we know as a power chord and that you played probably many, many, many times. Now, when playing the note C, for instance, on the 6th, 5th, 4th and 2nd string, you'll find the 5th by going 2 frets up and 1 string up. Starting with the note C on the 3rd string, then you have to go up 3 frets and 1 string up to find the 5th. To play the variations of the 5th interval, just raise the 5th in the interval shape, the highest note, 1 fret to create an augmented 5th. Lower that fifth one fret results in a diminished fifth. Also the fourth is an interval that is pretty common. On the sixth, fifth, fourth and second string, the notes of the interval are positioned below each other and in the same position on two adjacent strings. Very easy to remember and very easy to play. There's an exception on the third string where you find the fourth one fret up and one string down. The augmented fifth is created when you raise the highest note by half step or one fret. After this, the third and the sixth are the most played intervals on the guitar. When we start on the sixth, fifth, fourth and second string, we'll find the major third one fret down and one string up. Starting on the third string is different and you should keep the notes in the same position. So same fret, one string up. Now the minor third can be found on the sixth, fifth, fourth and second string by going two frets down and one string up. 
On the third string, you go one fret down and one string up to create a minor third. Now the sixth is a wired interval and needs string skipping, just like the octave. When playing the root of the interval on the sixth and fifth string, we'll find the major sixth one fret down and two strings up. And when starting on the third and fourth string, we'll find the sixth in the same position and two strings up. The minor version of the sixth can simply be found by going down an extra fret. Then we're left with the seventh, which is also a wide interval, just like the fifth, sixth and octave. On strings six and five, the major seventh can be found by going one fret up and two strings up. On the third string, things are different. Now you have to go two frets up and two strings up in order to get the major seventh interval. Now in order to create a minor seventh interval, just go up one fret less. Now every interval can be turned upside down to create an inversion of that interval. The new inversion is then equal to another interval. Now, if you want to know more about inversions, then I would like to suggest that you watch the QGEMTRIX video about triads and inversions. Now, for the inversions. Let me give you an example. A very common inversion of an interval on the guitar, and which you probably played a million million times, is the inversion of the fifth. And the fifth we all know as a power chord. Now, let's take that power chord uh, C5, and that is built from the root C and the fifth G. It sounds like this. Now in this interval, the root is the lowest note, the note C. And the highest note is of course the note G, the fifth. Now we can turn this upside down by playing the root C on top of the fifth G. Now the fifth G is the lowest note, and here you see we have created an inversion. Important to see and to understand is that the new inversion has become another interval, namely the fourth, because G to C is a distance of seven half steps and thus a fourth interval. Both intervals are considered to be consonant, which means that it is a pleasant sounding interval. The opposite of consonant is dissonant, which is an unpleasant sound with tension that most of the time will need to resolve to a consonant interval. We can do this with all the intervals and we'll see that if we invert the major second built from the root C and the note D becomes a minor seventh interval D to C. Both intervals sound dissonant, which, which means that uh, the sound has tension. The inversion of a major third C E becomes a minor sixth E C. Now I guess you get the picture by now. So, Let's look at all the possible intervals and inversions. Now, the inversion of a minor second becomes a major seventh. The inversion of a major second becomes a minor seventh. The inversion of a minor third becomes a major sixth. The inversion of a major third becomes a minor sixth. We've already seen that the inversion of the perfect fourth becomes a perfect fifth. The inversion of, uh, of a very dissonant augmented fourth stays a very dissonant augmented fourth because the root position and the inversion are exactly the same. By the way, this interval is called a tritone and splits a diatonic scale in two equal parts. Now the inversion of a perfect fifth becomes a perfect fourth. Needless to say is that it works the other way around too. The inversion of a minor sixth becomes a major third. The inversion of a major sixth becomes a minor third, a minor seventh becomes a major second, and a major seventh becomes a minor second. And the inversion of an octave obviously stays the same. So what can we derive from this? Well, one thing we'll see is that an inversion goes from a minor sound in the root position to a major sound in the inversion, and the other way around. It is also clear that a consonant interval, which is pleasant sounding, stays consonant in the inversion. A dissonant interval stays dissonant in the inversion. So you can use an inversion of intervals to create the same type of sound, only wider or narrower, depending on the interval that you invert. So a minor sixth from E to C and a major third from C to E can have the same purpose in music, but has a much wider sound. A bit simplistic, but that's the practical result. 
Now parallel intervals are intervals such as the fifth and the fourth, for instance, that move consecutively over different frets, like this. Now this has its origin in very old medieval music and has a very distinct sound. Now later in the 14th century using these parallel intervals were prohibited and strongly discouraged. I remember I had to learn this in counterpoint classes at the music academy. So when two fifths are played in a row, they didn't do it like this. But they corrected it like this. Now it was only in the beginning of the 20th century that parallel intervals were used uh, with consent. Nowadays in Western music in any style is crowded with parallel intervals and can create a recognizable sound and beautiful sound. And some guitarists even double their riffs in fourths or fifths to create a thick and darker sound. Now besides the intervals that fall within the 12 tone system or the 12 tone equal temperament system as it's called in music theory, there are also intervals that uh, are wider than the octave. For instance, an interval between the C and the note D that occurs in the next octave. Now that note D is the ninth note when we count from the root C. And logically we call this interval a ninth. Uh, as alternatives, we also have a flat 9, which is the interval from C to D flat, and the sharp 9, which is the interval from C to D sharp. Now, these intervals are designated as extended intervals. Now, not all extended intervals are useful. The extended intervals that are commonly used uh, as the ones that are used in chords are the 9th, the 11th and the 13th. All extensions can be raised and or flattened. The 9th can be a flat 9 or a sharp 9. And the 11th can be a sharp 11. The 13th can also be a flat 13th. Now the shapes on the neck of the guitar looks like this. The flat 9, the 9, Sharp 9, 11th, sharp 11th, flat 13th, 13th. Now that you learned all about the intervals, let's see uh, how you can use that knowledge to understand musical concepts better. Of course, this is besides the fact that learning intervals provides a huge benefit of learning the notes on the neck of the guitar and eventually provides ultimate freedom when improvising and frees you from a lifetime playing in patterns. So, what else can we learn from intervals? Well, there are a couple of things in which the knowledge of intervals can give you much more and clearer insight. Let me touch just a few of them. One simple thing is to get insight in the tuning of the guitar. Look at the fourth interval on the guitar. The fourth interval is positioned over one and the same fret except for the fourth over string three and two. From this, we can derive that our guitar is tuned in fourths like E, A, A, D, D, G, and B and E. String three, three and two are tuned in a major third, G, B. And you probably notice that uh, there's always a shift in positions or you always have to do something just a little different with those two strings. Well, now you know why because string two is tuned different than the rest of the strings. Now, another way to benefit from uh, interval knowledge is chord analysis. If you have a good understanding of the third, fifth, and seventh, then you can understand chords much better. Take the major seven chord, for instance. If someone would tell you that the chord exists of a major third, a perfect fifth, and a major seventh interval, it's now easy to build this on the neck of the guitar so you can visualize it better and understand it better. Find the major third, find the fifth, find the major seventh, and you're done. If you practice the intervals, uh, you develop a very good 
uh, ear for relative pitch. And this means that you can choose the intervals you play by ear and not by the technical ability of playing intervals um, or a convenient fingering that leads to brainless soloing. So uh, you should know how they sound and play them accordingly. And this makes that you can uh, write stronger melodies because they come from your head instead from your fingers. And Steve Vai mentioned this in relation to his epic song For the Love of God. This super strong melody came from whistling a tune that would later be the theme of this instrumental song. Now when you're playing the patterns everybody learns, uh, especially in the beginning, you're not actually thinking about the notes in relationship to the chords or the music you play over. Uh, knowing your intervals makes that you can choose more interesting notes and create interesting melody lines. So you break out from those patterns to sound more like you instead of the pattern that could confine your, musical, uh, confine your musicality. Now, we uh, all use effects to create the guitar sound we like, and some of those effects need to be adjusted by parameters and values. Now, two of those effects rely on pitch and intervals. And those are the pitch shifter and the harmonizer. Um, with these effects, you can create a harmony or change the pitch of notes you're playing. If you know your intervals, you can create some very special and beautiful sounds with these effects. Otherwise, it would be trial and error to get the right result. Now, of course, there are more benefits of learning intervals, but since I'm not selling them, I'll end the promotion here. Now, intervals are the building blocks of music, and they can be used for melodies and harmony and are essential to understand and write music. Now, we have seen that uh, there are intervals between every note of the 12-tone equal temperament system and that intervals have their own inversions. We've also seen that there are very wide intervals that span more than an octave, which are called extended intervals. Now they are present in extended chords like the 9, 11 and 13 chords. And we've also seen the advantage of knowing your intervals to learn the notes on the neck of the guitar, develop relative pitch, break loose from pattern playing, choosing interesting notes, understanding chord structures and adapt settings on the specific guitar effects in a sensible and educated way. All this should, should give you a good understanding of intervals. So, I hope this was crystal clear again and that you can benefit from this lesson to become yet a greater guitar player than you already was. So, eternal fame lies ahead. Well, eventually. Next time we'll uh, take this interval stuff to a next level and create some interesting wide interval licks and arpeggio ideas. See you next time in a crystal clear QGEMTREX guitar tutorial. Bye!